Welcome everybody. Um, thank you all for joining our first Green Poop Forum of 2021 on the theme of Nature First. Um, I'm Daniel Waring, I'm the Secretary of the Green Poop Forum and also the Environmental Sustainability Officer for East Suffolk Council. Um, but before I hand over to our Chair to commence today's meeting, I'd just like to mention a few housekeeping points and then explain how the meeting uh, will run today. Um, so firstly, a reminder that we are recording the session today and this is so that we can make it available to those who couldn't attend and also ensure that all comments and questions that are submitted through chat are captured so that we can address anonymously in the event report any questions that we don't have time to cover today. So if you don't want your image to appear in the recording, please disable or cover your camera. Um, you may also find that that helps if you experience any issues with your network connection. And also, if you haven't already indicated your consent for us to use the recording in these ways, please could you email me at greenissues at eastsuffolk.gov.uk. Um, secondly, please keep your microphones muted unless you're in invited by the chair to speak. Um, there will be an opportunity for questions after the break, uh, which will be for about five minutes at around about 3 p.m. Um, but as there are so many of us on the call and time is short, we will ask for these to be submitted via the chat function, please. Um, our steering group will be using the break to select the most interesting questions um, to be put to our panel of speakers. So for the best chance of having a question aired, um, if you could submit it before the break, that would be, that would be great. Um, time permitting though, we might be able to field a few more questions submitted during and after the break as well. Um, and thirdly, as we anticipate that there will be more questions than we can possibly hope to air during this session, uh, we will, of course, respond to all questions that are submitted as part of the follow-up event report, which will be circulated to, to everyone on the call afterwards. And now, for, for those of you who don't know, um, the Green Print Forum is a voluntary network of people and organisations who are concerned with enabling positive community action and our vision is as, as shown on screen bottom left. Um, our network is free and it's open to all um, who wish to inform and benefit from our learning. So if you're not already a member, we would very much welcome you. Um, and we do also have um, channels on Facebook and Twitter if you happen to be on social media yourselves. Um, now this year we're focusing on one of the nine areas that contribute to our vision and that's nature first. Um, hence the purpose of today's event, um, which is after we've heard some brief project updates from our chair, is to hear about some of the wonderful initiatives that are being led by organisations, large and small, that help care for nature, and to share that knowledge and hopefully inspire more people to get involved actively caring for nature. Um, so we'll hear about some of the projects that our guest speakers have kindly spared time to share with us today, as well as some from our wider membership base who have offered to share a little bit about their own grassroots projects too. Um, so, I hope that you can take away with you some learning and inspiration from today's session. And I'll now hand over to our chair, Jane Healy, to open today's forum. Thanks, Daniel. Um, hello. I'm chair of Green Print Forum, and I'm a member of Transition Woodbridge. Uh, I'm really excited to be part of this first virtual Green Print event. Um, bringing to you our mission to encourage everybody to think about biodiversity and how we can help promote it. But before we start, um, we'd like to update you on a couple of our projects. Plastic Action is the first one to talk about. Um, this contributes to our theme of a pollution-free environment. And during 2020-21, We've continued to work with Jason Alexander of Rubbish Walks to coordinate our network of plastic action champions in local communities and organisations who act as ambassadors in those networks to support the movement for reduced dependency on single use plastic and to tackle plastic pollution. So far, we've got over 80 volunteers registered on the scheme and whilst we haven't been able to have events and face-to-face -face engagements um, due to COVID, many of these people have been carrying out activities like writing articles for local newsletters, including our own green print quarterly newsletter, arranging socially distanced litter picks, 
encouraging their places of work or study to make positive changes on single use stuff, writing to retailers to encourage them to make changes, making allotment greenhouses from repurposed materials, liaising with local councils for additional litter bins at hotspots, and using their blogs and Instagram accounts to help spread the word online. And some even contributed their time as expert speakers during the recent Siren Digital Online Festival by Young People for Young People in February. We're even aware of two champions who've made it their New Year's resolution to combine their daily exercise with a litter pick and do at least 365 separate litter picks during 2021. The Green Print Forum and Jason Alexander also linked in with Suffolk Action Week last October to deliver three virtual training sessions that month for newly recruited champions. And we've also promoted our plastic pollution learning resources on our website as an online learning resource for teachers and homeschoolers during lockdown. So I'd like to say on behalf of Green Print Forum and us all, a massive thank you to all of you uh, wonderful people. Our second project, which you may have heard about recently, uh, there's been a lot of publicity about the Quiet Lanes Suffolk project in Snape and Glemsford recently. This contributes to our theme of active travel through encouraging the use of rural lanes through a formal designation to preserve the existing tran tranquility of suitable lanes. In 2018, our former chair, Andrew Cassie, was quietly collating expressions of interest in the principal from parish councils and used that community interest to gain support from the Green Print Forum, who applied for a grant from East Suffolk to support the development of low cost, community led self health model to secure designations for more quiet lanes in the district. In the meantime, more expressions of interest flooded in from the rest of Suffolk, which, along with the initial funding secured by Greenprint from East Suffolk, helped to leverage out even more funding from Suffolk County Council's 2020 fund to enable the project to go beyond East Suffolk and be truly county-wide. Interest in the project has gone way beyond our initial expectations with over 40% of Suffolk parishes registering at least one candidate lane. And as we enter 2021, the process is well underway with the first signs having gone up in Snape just last week, alongside the soft launch of a concurrent awareness raising campaign to encourage all users of quiet lanes to take extra care with the slogans of expect and respect. And if you see this sign, take your time. By the end of 2021, subject to local consultations and final sign off of designation by S uh, Suffolk County County Highways, we hope to see more than 200 new quiet lanes designated countywide, with local networks of lanes created in some areas where neighbouring parishes have collaborated on selecting shared lanes. This is an absolutely fantastic project and well done to Andy and all his team for, uh, for getting so much interest. So I'd like to uh, move on to today's event, our, uh, our wonderful Nature First. Uh, we're going to listen to some speakers, as Daniel said first, and then we're going to have a little break. And after that, we'll hear about what's going on grassroots. So first of all, I'm sure our first speaker, James, Councillor James Mallander, needs very little introduction. James is the chair of East Suffolk Council Environment Task Group, and he's the cabinet member for the environment. So over to you, James, to start us off. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, good afternoon, and on behalf of East Suffolk, I welcome you all to our Nature First mini conference. It's great to see so many familiar faces, but also it's a, a particular warm welcome to our new friends. Uh, and if this is your first event, a very warm welcome. Spring has sprung, the weekend has brought dry weather, daffodils are bursting with flower, and the sound of lawn mowers are coming back to life. The natural world is waking up just as our society is waking up. 
And as we slowly emerge from the COVID hibernation, the frost of lockdown is thawing. And I feel for the first time in a long time, positive and excited about the future. I have to admit, looking at your projects and knowing some of you personally, I'm in admiration in your commitment, energy and enthusiasm that you bring to this issue. Like you, I can clearly see that changes in the environment around us. I want to do something about it. I hope through uh, my engagement and the commitment to be suffered, you can see we are focusing on making a difference, not just baby steps, but substantial changes in the delivery of our services. Nature First is East Suffolk's years long focus on biodiversity. Sometimes the environmental debate gets stuck on one issue, but it's really important to look at the bigger picture. East Suffolk is blessed with diverse habitats from shingle beaches to deep forests and everything in between. Much has been designated as uh, AONB. Large national infrastructural projects need careful consideration. Farming methods need to move from just yield and profit to sustainability and quality. And house builders by developers need to prioritize environmental considerations. This conference is important to me to celebrate therefore what we are doing in our communities and to engage and swap ideas in how you as individuals and communities put nature first. And here at East Suffolk, we are playing our part by putting nature first in our new initiatives. Hard in the weeds, we are feeding the bees is our flagship policy here at East Suffolk. Introduced last year, it's now in its second year and bigger and better. We have over a hundred sites across the district where we're supporting our biodiversity. Uh, Daniel, perhaps put the first slide up, please. Introduced last year, it's now in its second year, bigger and better. Cutting of the grassland will only take place in the autumn to allow glass, grasses and wildflowers to grow. This in turn supports our insects and in particular our pollinators. Of course we cut paths and edges, but this massively reduced cutting has a profound impact. This really is sustainable management. Since the 1930s, we have lost over 97% of our wildflower meadows. Farmers are plowing up to the periphery of the fields, eliminating, eliminating that frame of wildflowers, and new houses have the smallest of gardens. And the key is also creating corridors so wildlife can move across East Suffolk. My ultimate ambition is if a bee started in Felixstowe, it could travel all the way to Lowestoft. So not only does this uh, less cutting support our nature, but by putting nature first, we can see secondary effects, slowing down traffic through the visible changes and that scientific fact where we see engagement with our natural environment lifts the spirits and makes us happier. I've expanded this concept and I'm pleased to announce last week a new sustainable management of our cemeteries that East Suffolk manages along with the closed churchyards which the council maintains. Now we will cut paths to those graves visited but the other areas, the grass will grow. Something is quite spiritual to think of that concept of death and then a strong sense of life these areas will bring. And of course, these cemeteries are often in the middle of urban areas. So they become pocket parks, the mini Minsmere on our doorstep. We continue to develop our property portfolio to make sure we combine my favorite concept of the environment and development working together. It's not a binary relationship, and so we continue to landscape our estate. Our new sports facilities will very much incorporate planting and natural enhancement. At our offices in Melton, where we have direct control over our office and landscaping, we are also pioneering a new sustainable management of our open spaces by deliberately appointing a company, Greener Growth, to manage the estate that puts the environment at the core of its decision process. If any of you visit, and I encourage you to stop for coffee at Honey & Co and just walk around the area, homes for wildlife are dotted across the estate from insect houses, bee houses, bird boxes big and small, and even to swift boxes actually fitted under the roof of our building. And let me add, these swift homes were introduced only after the interve intervention of the Greenprint Forum. Ponds have also been established. Mature trees are incorporated in the design and new trees planted. And if you look carefully, not those dreadful plastic sleeves that imprison the saplings, but breathable biodegradable protection, clearly showcasing how nature can easily be incorporated into any development. This new management has been so successful, we are incorporating nature into our new developments for the Devon School project at Felixstowe. Here, nature will be designed right into the development, not retrofitted. 
emphasizing my fundamental belief, it's not a binary relationship, but a building and a tree can and should work together. There is space for all of us. A small revolution unnoticed is taking place here where the environment really is at the heart of this council. Nature as a priority for East Suffolk continues and I'm pleased to announce this year we'll be reducing the spraying of glyphosate by over 45% and I have bigger ambitions to reduce it further if not eliminate it. We're now piloting a phone control of weeds. Let me share you into a little secret. Suffolk County Council have been so impressed with our shift to sustainable management of our grassland they too are following our lead to reduce glyphosate spraying. Even Pardon the Weeds, who are feeding the bees campaign, has been looked at by Norfolk County Council, clearly showing East Suffolk is a leader in biodiversity enhancement here in local government. Looking at environmentalist social media, it is a narrative of doom and gloom. And don't get me wrong, there are serious problems, but I absolutely believe we should champion the positive. Look at what you are doing, the difference you make in our community. And when organisations act, the changes are even bigger. Highlighted by the RSPB as one of the biggest species success stories in UK conservation history, the red kite comeback was ex has exceeded all expectations. In the 1990s, the birds of prey were virtually extinct in the UK and extinct in Ireland. But the release of 13 young kites near London has been hugely successful. And a similar scheme in Scotland has succeeded too. What a great success story when we act. The decline in the house sparrow has been stopped, and in particular in areas such as East Suffolk, goldfinches and long-tailed tits are breeding healthily. What I'm trying to say is that we do not, do not need to accept the decline in our birds and wildlife, but with a small effort we can halt and reverse these trends. And in our discussions with the environment in particular, at global level, even I get palpitations in thinking how we're going to solve the problems. But let's leave this to the big leaders, and we should focus here on what we can control and what we can do. And of course, the easiest thing to do is to look in our own gardens or even our window boxes. Making a wildlife pond, adding water to your garden makes a huge difference, not only to the aquatic creatures that move in from nowhere, but from the many animals, especially birds, that visit to drink and bathe insect spaces, a log pile, an insect hotel. If insects move in, then the birds will follow. And as I mentioned earlier, those wildlife highways, often in modern developments, gardens are really sealed in, but allowing gaps for movement is really important, especially for hedgehogs. In the 1950s, we had over 30 million hedgehogs across the UK. And in the 1990s, only 1.5 million, and the numbers are falling. Let our hedges grow thicker and wilder, and if I had my way, any fence put in place, I'd require a hedge to be planted alongside. Hedges are such an important habitat for both birds to nest and roost, and of course offer five-star restaurants for birds with insects and berries. And flowers through the growing season, particular lavender and buddleia, always top the list for insects. In fact, these are the principles we look at when designing our council estates. And of course, as you are doing, sharing seeds and plants with friends and neighbours and allowing that natural circus of life. And just like Pardon the Weeds campaign, let the grass grow. Consider mowing just a strip around the margin of lawns and letting the areas grow and the wildlife move in. Even Monty Don is now talking about the importance of longer grass rather than cutting all your garden. And if these were not reasons enough, all of us who garden know it's important for our physical and mental well-being. And these are exactly the projects we focus on throughout East Suffolk. We are not helpless and we are very much part of the debate and solution. We are the first generation to understand the problem, but we will be the last generation to do something about it. We don't always have to point and ask what everyone else is doing, but it's OK to focus on what we are doing. And that's what I ask. We all just do something. We can't all save the world, but you can think about your back garden and how you can enhance your community but by always by putting nature first in your decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. That was lovely and inspiring and some fantastic work going on. Um, let's move to our next uh, speaker. And I'm delighted to introduce Michael Strand, who's the community fundraising manager for Suffolk Wildlife Trust. Over to you, Michael. 
Thanks very much indeed, Jane. And uh, thanks to everyone for inviting me here today. Uh, well, I'm not sure if I can top that, really. Uh, that, was, that was fantastic. Really great to hear about all the activities. And I have to say, living in Woodbridge myself, it's been great to uh, walk around the local cemeteries and see the uh, Pardon the Weeds uh, signs up and about. Uh, that's really, really exciting um, as a project, as is um, the Quiet Lanes one as well. So, you yeah, know, really fantastic. Um, well, I'm, I, I'm here to talk with you uh, today. I'm going to share a screen, first of all, actually, well, before I get carried away. Bear with me. What I'm about to share with you today, um, I actually haven't shared with anyone in Suffolk Wildlife Trust other than a few key people. Um, I'm going to be doing that tomorrow. So you're, it's completely hot off the press and you'll have to excuse me uh, if it seems a little bit vague because it certainly is um, a concept um, and a way of working which is going to be challenging for us as an organisation. Um, but what we think uh, is going to be a key for turning around the fortunes for the natural world uh, moving forward in the next 10 years. It's called Team Wilder. Um, so what is Team Wilder? Well, it's, it's all of the work that all of us do with people, essentially. It's, it's uh, engaging everyone we can, whether it's babies, children, adults, um, from all walks of life, whether uh, private residents, businesses, landowners and farmers, organisations, communities, uh, families and individuals, uh, and that's in school, in work and in leisure. Uh, Team Wilder is about harnessing uh, mass participation uh, for the benefit of the natural world and wildlife across the whole of Suffolk. Um, we believe it will address how to make the voices and choices of everyone, not just a few, count for something. Uh, in this case, uh, improving our natural environment even more. So why, why Team Wilder, uh, I ask you here. Uh, I ask you say, sorry. Um, we do have a problem, uh, despite uh, the councillor's very positive words, we do have a problem um, for species. Um, you know, over in the, in, in the last uh, 60 years, the Trust is 60, uh, 60 years old this year in June, the Trust and many, many other organisations have been working incredibly hard to try and do something for the natural world. But uh, wherever we look on any, um, pr pretty much on every um, graph, uh, whether it's in Suffolk or the UK, in Europe, on across the world, biodiversity is in decline. And in some cases, it's in huge decline. And this slide just indicates a few species, uh, which you can see the downward trend uh, from top left to bottom right there. But we also have another issue. Uh, this one's quite an interesting one. And that's about people's concern for wildlife, which is for uh, the first time ever at a record high. If you take YouGov's um, stats uh, of anything to uh, to uh, believe. So that's a really interesting dichotomy there. Well, huge wildlife decline, yet environmental concern at record high. So what's going on? Well, this is um, an, another graph which uh, looks at pro-environmental values versus actions. And this was a survey that was done over 10 years by Natural England. And if you look at that left hand column there, the green column uh, with values, you can see you've got things there like 94% of the people surveyed said that having a green space close to them was really important. 92% of people said that they were concerned about damage to the natural environment. And if you look at that middle section uh, where it says household actions, around about 70% of us are recycling at home, for example. But when you move to the right hand column where it says conservation actions, only 10% of us are either donating with money or supporting um, conservation or wildlife or natural environment um, uh, issues and less than 4% of us are volunteering our time. And we uh, at Suffolk Wildlife Trust and in conservation sector would like to see those conservation action um, steps 
going much, much higher. And this is what we call, um, if I just forward a slide, this is what we call the value action gap. Lots of people saying one thing, but actually doing something completely different. So how are we going to fix this? Well, we believe through um, our new approach called Team Wilder. Uh, in order for, for nature to recover, we need many more people on nature's side. I know many of the people that are here today through uh, name or through some work we've done in the future, but we really need to be engaging with uh, all those new people, all those people on, on, the, on the periphery um, to make this really work. We want more people to move from inaction to action. And I know there's some fantastic projects that are gonna be spoken about today and people are doing. And uh, as the councillor said, you know, every small action is totally significant. Um, the science says now that if just one person in every four, so 25% of us takes some action, this can be enough to change the minds and critically the behavior of the majority. Now, you know, as I said, I know there's many of you already here involved with some great environmental projects, but Team Wilder will seek to harness yours and others' efforts if you so choose to, um, to be a part of it in the future. It will guide and support others. It will influence change. It will inspire action. And it will also mean the Suffolk Wildlife Trust taking a more action focused approach in its own delivery moving forward. We as an organisation, a charity, um, Suffolk's Nature Charity, will be transforming ourselves in a new way of working to meet this challenge. So um, that's kind of it at the minute. It is pretty vague, I know. Um, however, I'm just going to um, throughout the UK, um, a number of other organisations have been leading uh, with this kind of approach, uh, looking at Team Wilder uh, for another wild, uh, in other wildlife trusts and behaviour change in other organisations. I'm just going to share with you a very short uh, animated video of, which has been done by the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. Uh, and uh, they're a few steps ahead of us uh, by, by a, a year and a half, couple of years. Uh, but this it kind of summarises again what I've just said. Uh, but in a, in a slightly more modern way. And then I'll, I'll just finish off. So if you just bear with me one minute, hopefully this will work. Look outside your door and you'll find some of the UK's most wonderful wildlife, from bats, birds and butterflies to poppies and pond life. But times are changing. You may already know that the humble hedgehog is in trouble. 95% of our prickly pals have already disappeared, and they're not alone. One by one, the calls of turtle doves and nightingales have disappeared too. The rate of decline started slowly, but it's speeding up. We're approaching an irreversible tipping point. But with your help, we can tip the scales back into nature's favour. If just one in four people are willing to take action that supports our wildlife, we can transform our counties. You can start as small and as local as you like. You could cut a hole in your garden fence to create a hedgehog highway, plant bee-friendly flowers in your window box, or join like-minded neighbours in lobbying your local MP. Each contribution can make a big difference. Like the butterfly that flaps its wings and causes a tornado. Whatever action you take, Team Wilder can help. Join Team Wilder today and you'll find all the advice, training and support you, your school or your community needs. So why not join Team Wilder now and start mending our broken nature network? Great. So yeah, just to finish off, um, I'd just like to say that obviously um, as and when uh, more is to be said, more that I can share more with you, I will do. Um, however, my email address is at the top there. So if anybody would like to register their, their general interest in Team Wilder, uh, please email me and I will keep your, 
contact on record and as and when I'm, there's something that I can share with you, I will. Um, we can put nature into back into recovery. Um, we can create more space for wildlife to thrive and reduce the pressure on the natural environment. It's going, Team Wild is going to be a joint effort. We've all got different skills, knowledge and experience to offer. Um, and um, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I, I, as I say, I'm sorry it's a little bit vague, but thank you for listening and uh, I'll look forward to some questions later. Cheers. Thanks very much, uh, Michael. Thank you. That looks a, an extremely exciting project and um, I'm sure lots of us will want to uh, work together with you and, and um, the Suffolk Wildlife Trust in particular to help bring it about. Um, so um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, next, we're going to go to um, Alex Mordelutz from the AONB. He, he's got a um, pre-recorded presentation, but he is on the call for questions later on. Hello. My name is Alex Moore-Dallus and I started as the Nature Recovery Officer for the Suffolk Coast and Heaths and Dedham Vale AOMBs at the beginning of June last year. And I'm pleased to have been given the opportunity to give you an update on nature recovery in the Suffolk Coast and Heaths AOMB. To begin, I'm going to give some context and a small reminder as to how the nature recovery plan fits within the broader nature recovery national picture. The establishment of a national nature recovery network is an integral part of the government's 25 year environment plan and they have set four key nature recovery objectives within it to be achieved by 2042. These targets include the restoration of 75% of protected sites on land to favourable condition, the creation or restoration of 500,000 hectares of additional wildlife rich habitat outside protected sites, the recovery of threatened and iconic animal and plant species by providing more diverse and better connected habitats. And finally, a target to increase woodland cover. Although the conservation of wildlife has always been part of the AOMB's remit to conserve and enhance natural beauty, the Glover Review has strengthened the emphasis AOMB's place upon wildlife conservation and nature recovery has become more central to the purposes of designated landscapes. And we welcome this as long as we are sufficiently resourced to carry out nature recovery efficiently. So in response to the Glover Review and the Environment Plan, the 36 AOMBs in England and Wales made a long-term commitment to nature recovery through the Colchester Declaration in 2019. Included within the declaration targets in the short term are for each AOMB to produce a nature recovery plan, which is almost finished for the Suffolk Coast and Heath AOMB, but also some more, some ambitious longer term targets to aim for by 2030. And you will see how they align with the targets in the 25 year environment plan. The targets include getting 200,000 hectares of triple SIs in AOMBs into favorable condition, the creation and restoration of 100,000 hectares of wildlife rich habitat outside of protected sites in AOMBs. The creation of 36,000 hectares of new woodland will have been planted or allowed to regenerate in AOMBs. And lastly, to improve the conservation status of at least 30 species relevant to AOMBs. Thank you to all our partners that were able to fill out the Nature Recovery Plan survey back in September. We have carefully considered the responses we've had and are building them into the nature recovery plan where appropriate. We had a good level of positive feedback on our seven proposed nature recovery core zones, so we intend to stick with them in the plan. These core zones are the largest connected expanses of wildlife rich sites in the Suffolk Coast and Heath AOMB. A sizable proportion of them are protected and designated sites, but they are also made up of non-designated wildlife rich areas as well. It is our ambition to form working groups for all of these core zones where partners, landowners and local people who manage and own the land within them will be invited to explore nature recovery opportunities. But very importantly, landowners owning land connected to these core 
zones, i.e. land currently outside, will also be invited to explore opportunities for habitat creation with the aim of expanding the size of these nature recovery core zones, along with opportunities for connectivity, i.e. connecting wildlife rich sites within the core zones to the wider environment outside. We envisage that the role of the AOMB will differ in each of the nature recovery core zones. In core zones B and C, for example, where a high percentage of the land is already reserves and triple SIs, it's expected that the role of the AOMB will be less active as the land is already in great hands being managed by the experts such as the RSPB, Suffolk Wildlife Trust and the National Trust, etc. The AOMB has no intention of interfering with any of the brilliant conservation work that goes on in these areas. However, could the AOMB, for example, help to engage landowners in the surrounding landscape to help make the core zones bigger and better connected, and the AOMB can take a more leading role in, in some of the other core zones to help set up partnerships, engage with landowners and facilitate conservation work. I've picked one of our core zones just as, as an example to show, to show you, which is core zone G. This is the largest identified nature recovery core zone within the plan. It includes the store and oral estuaries and surrounding areas, including habitats within the AOMB extension area. One of the things I've been working on whilst writing the plan is looking at the potential for habitat creation and restoration within and connected to each of the core zones. So to do this, I've used the national habitat network maps, which have been produced by Natural England recently to assist in the creation of a national nature recovery network. So using core zone G as an example, I've been able to calculate the overall size of the existing priority habitats in addition to establishing the potential for habitat creation and restoration for these habitats. So if you take reed beds, just as an example, there are currently 55.96 hectares in core zone G. There is, however, the potential to restore 523 hectares of reed beds. There are 194 hectares of reed bed that fall within the fragmentation action zone and 1,151 hectares within network enhancement zone one, which is likely to be suitable for reed bed creation. So just to explain a little bit about what that means, the brown sections on the map show the primary habitat, i.e. the existing reed bed habitat, which I know you can't see very well on this slide, so I apologise for that. The dark green sections on the map show where the potential is to restore reed bed habitat. So these are areas of land which are predominantly composed of existing semi-natural habitat where reed bed is present in a degraded or fragmented form and which are likely to be suitable for restoration. The pink areas you can see are known as Network Enhancement Zone 1, and these areas contain land connecting existing patches of reed bed habitat and its associated habitats, which are likely to be suitable for the creation of new reed bed habitat. And lastly, the light green areas on the map is the, is the Fragmentation Action Zone for reed beds, and that is the land within Network Enhancement Zone 1 that connects existing patches of reed bed and associated habitats which are currently highly fragmented and where fragmentation could be reduced by habitat creation. Although we will be including some species recovery projects in the Nature Recovery Plan, we will be mainly focusing on landscape scale projects, habitat creation and enhancement, which will be to the benefit of a multitude of different species throughout the AOMB. Within the Nature Recovery Plan, we are prioritising 10 habitats within the AOMB. But this does not mean that habitats not listed here will be ignored. We have adopted a tiered approach with seven habitats being identified as highest priority in tier one and three other habitats with a slightly lower level of priority in tier two. There are a number of different reasons as to why we have selected these 10 habitats, which I don't have time to discuss in this presentation. The flagship species to represent the Coast and Heath AOMB has been selected, the red shank, Back in September last year, we facilitated a Zoom debate where we invited our environmental partners with an interest in the AOMB's wildlife to pitch for a species, contribute to a debate and then cast votes at the end. Although we had some fantastic pitches for other species, the red shank was the worthy winner in the end. 
It was selected for a variety of different reasons, which again, I'm afraid I don't have time to discuss in this presentation. Similarly to habitats, we have adopted a tiered approach to priority species. We have selected nine species in addition to red shank for tier one, and are made up of seven other species that were pitched for by environmental partners at the flagship species Zoom debate. There were many good arguments for why they should be prioritised, so we felt it made a lot of sense to prioritise them within the nature recovery plan. Two other species were added to tier one, brown hare and large garden bumblebee, because they received the highest number of votes in the nature recovery plan survey. Tier two species are made up of species that met the necessary criteria and received the most votes after brown hare and large garden bumblebee in the nature recovery plan survey. One of our nature recovery aspirations that we asked for feedback on in the nature recovery plan consultation was over the formation of a nature recovery urban area and our top choice was Ipswich. This was well received and so we felt it made sense to try and join the existing Wild Ipswich partnership to see if we can help meet some of the objectives of the network. Another popular nature recovery aspiration was for the AOMB to work in partnership with the Broads Authority to try and bridge the gap between the Norfolk Broads and the northern tip of the AOMB by improving connectivity and working collaboratively on nature recovery initiatives. We have an initial scoping meeting to discuss options with the Broads Authority and Natural England on April the 7th. Let's not forget that nature is in a very precarious position at this point in time and it needs all our collective efforts to restore its fortunes so we are particularly keen on delivering projects today and not always tomorrow so here is a, an update on some of the projects that we've been working on so far we have received some funding from natural england to carry out a red shank awareness campaign and we have made some good progress on this and thanks to partners who have helped with this project so far. We have produced a red shank awareness postcard that will assist us with the awareness raising work. We have trained up 25 volunteers to assist with various activities including putting up signs on footpath posts in appropriate places to carry out red shank counts and conduct surveys and carry out visitor engagement work. Volunteers will also be helping to carry out bird surveys in Shotley and to educate the public about birds that are present on the Shingle Beach and along the estuary, with the long-term aim of increasing visitor enjoyment of the area and to reduce disturbance to key species of birds such as red shank, brent geese and curlew. We have also teamed up with SOS Swifts, who are in the process of locating 80 AOMB funded Swift boxes and 13 callers in various locations throughout the AOMB. I have very recently submitted a bid to the Galloper Wind Farm Fund to carry out a Laced and Love Swift project, which will involve installation of more Swift boxes and callers alongside Swift awareness raising activities to be carried out within a five kilometre radius of Sizewell. And finally, the Shotley Gate Community Orchard project, which is part funded through the AOMB SDF fund, is making good progress. All the orchard trees have been planted, a new native hedge has also been planted, and now the group is starting on the ground preparation and seed sowing to help establish a wildflower meadow. Many thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Alex, for that presentation. Uh, a lot of food for thought there. Um, right, let's go to our next speaker. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Adrian Cooper, who's going to tell us about his initiative that he started in Felixstowe called the Felixstowe Community Nature Reserve. Over to you, Adrian, please. So, thank you, Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me say first of all that I really appreciate having this opportunity to tell you all about the work of Felix Doe's Community Nature Reserve. 
Phoenix Downs Community Nature Reserve is a network of small wildlife friendly spaces in local people's back gardens, allotments and window boxes and even balconies of local apartments. And what we ask our members to do is to allocate at least three square yards of their land for any kind of wildlife friendly features which they want to have. So examples might include pollinator friendly plants, wildlife ponds, hedgehog homes, hedgehog tunnels between neighbours fences, bird feeders and insect lodges in any combination of those features which people want to have. And we also encourage local people to allocate some space in their gardens for rewilding. So that means that we ask people to just leave nature alone and allow nature to weave its own micro ecosystems. And that's always fascinating because people end up with amazing combinations of self-set plants with all the insects and other wildlife which comes from rewilding. So we have our network of small green spaces and within that network we have all sorts of green corridors where a sequence of neighbours is doing the same thing together and they're cooperating. And the benefit of all that network building and green corridor making is that our members are telling us that we're improving local biodiversity. And I can say that because in May last year, Felix Doe's Citizen Science Group did an impact analysis on the work of Felix Doe's Community Nature Reserve. And that impact analysis asked a sample of 100 members of Felix Doe's Community Nature Reserve how things had changed. So from that impact analysis, I can tell you that 62% of people sampled said that they had seen an improvement in the biodiversity of their gardens since they'd been a part of Felix Doe's Community Nature Reserve. Also, 68% of people sampled explained that they grow plants which are recommended on our Facebook page. And 66% of people in the survey said that they grow pollinator friendly plants, which again, we recommend. So it's very encouraging, but of course, there's still lots more work to be done. So overall, if you add together all the small pieces of land which local people devote to wildlife friendly activities, the total area now is well over the size of a football pitch. And again, that conclusion comes from the outstanding work completed by Felix Stowe's Citizen Science Group, because they've shown that the average allocation of space within the Community Nature Reserve is a little over 3.65 square yards per member. And they've also counted well over 1,650 active members in the project. So multiplying 3.65 by 1,650, you get a total area of 6,022 square yards. So that's well over the minimum area required by the Football Association for a full-sized football pitch. So that's where we are now. We've been around since May 2015 when the idea of a community nature reserve first came to mind. And today we work a lot with other communities, such as the Ipswich Community Nature Reserve, where Stephanie Cullen is doing just a brilliant job coordinating things. In Woodbridge, the team at Transition Woodbridge is adapting some of our ideas for their community. So is the Breadfield Wildlife Friendly Village and the Brightling Sea Nature Network and further afield in Leicestershire, the Cosby Community Nature Reserve is doing brilliant work up there through Marie Milner Armstrong. And we've even inspired a community nature reserve in Portugal called Pontas and Vida. But increasingly, we encourage young people in the Felixstowe area to get involved in our work. And we have a brilliant youth representative. That is Luke Smout, who's doing all that work for us. We've worked with a, a group for, of digital media students from the University of Suffolk to produce a short film about our work. We also love to work with various partners, including Suffolk Wildlife Trust, who made a film back in 2019 about community-based conservation, which included our work in Felixstowe.
And we've also been featured in the current winter spring edition of the RSPB magazine called Nature's Home, which is distributed to 400,000 RSPB members. We've been featured in the I newspaper in November last year. We're a member of the National Biodiversity Network, and they're the UK's largest network of conservation groups. And our work has been featured in magazines and podcasts across the United States and Canada. And of course, Felix Stowe Citizen Science Group, which does all our data collection and data analysis, is a network supporter of the European Citizen Science Association. So what we do in Felix Stowe is always given a much larger audience. So again, it's encouraging, isn't it? But whenever other people from other communities learn about Felixstowe's Community Nature Reserve, they often ask how we began. So with that question in mind, I need to take you back to May 2015. So that was when we began. And I knew that something should be done to help local people to get involved in conservation work in the Felixstowe area, because local wildlife populations were falling at an alarming rate. So I just started talking to local people about what could be done and lots of ideas came and went. But eventually we realised that there was no way we could afford to buy an area of, of land. No one was going to give us a, a parcel of land at, at all. So we couldn't create an urban nature reserve. Uh, and so we had to really think up a new kind of nature reserve. Not a single area of land, but as a network of small areas of local people's back gardens. So the benefit of that was to give everyone an opportunity to take part. And then I just carried on talking to more and more local people until I had a team around me who understood what the vision was and how we could achieve it. So by the end of 2015, having started in May that year, we had a core team of supporters who were telling their family, friends and neighbours about what we were doing and why we were doing it. And that's always been the way we choose to grow, by one person telling another member of their family or their friends or their neighbours. So we've never had large meetings because we've been told by the, the people we work with, they feel far more comfortable discussing our work in their kitchens or their lounge over coffee and cake or pizza and ice cream if they prefer, instead of anything more formal and intimidating. And another important feature of Felix Doe's Community Nature Reserve is that we have no money. In actual fact, we don't even have a bank account. But the wonderful thing about having no money at all is that it's made us very creative indeed, which is fun. And we've also become very gregarious. So we love to make new friends in order to get things done. But another great thing about having no money is that when other groups come along and ask about our work and how it was begun, they never have to worry about funding applications because you don't need money to start a community nature reserve. And even today, we encourage people not to spend money on plants or plant pots or even garden canes, because it's almost for, always far better to organise plant swapping and plant pot swapping and even garden cane swapping. And the reason why swapping is such a good idea, it gets people talking. Friendships start and then cooperation starts as well. And that's always the way we, we, uh, we, we move forward, using free opportunities such as the wonderful Spotlight on Felixstowe magazine, which allows us to share our message to 14,500 local households every month. So that really is where we are with Felixstowe's Community Nature Reserve. Well, you know, I think that's fantastic, Adrian. <laughs> oh, thank you, Shane. Um, absolutely inspiring. Thank oh, you. Thank, thank you. you for all your efforts. Thank and you. um, anyway, uh, we're going to take a break now. Um, thank you to all our speakers. Everybody's had the opportunity to have a quick break. Um, I just want to check, um, Jane, are you on the call and are you happy to... Um, to lead the rest of the session now. Yeah, I'm back now, Daniel. Yep, all good. Right, so this is this is uh, another exciting part of our, our, our presentation, our event. Um, we're going to have a look at some of our local grassroots projects. And uh, Betsy Reed 
is going to tell us about hedge planting in watering field to start us off. So this is watering field hedge heroes. If we could have, we would have bought a piece of land and established a forest. Everybody knows how difficult that is. So the best we can manage is gapping up hedges and our hedges are very, very gappy. This is, this is quite a big thing because it involves getting permission from landowners and sometimes it's not all that easy to establish who actually does own a particular piece of land. That said, we've managed to find some hedges and I think there are some pictures that you can see us working at gapping up. So there you go, here's our timeline, desperate to plant more trees, restoring hedges. So we, our initial section was 100, uh, 100 metres of native mixed hedging, and thanks to all the people who's, who offered money. And um, in January last year, just shortly before lockdown, we managed to, we managed to plant out uh, a nice lot of, of hedging. And I think there might be some pictures. Okay. Um, yeah, so this was, this was, we got a local farmer to rotivate this land. I know that lots of hedging is planted directly in among the nettles and so on, but as we've already had a, com a comment that sometimes you need to control nature a little bit. And I also know that, um, that bramble is regarded the thorn is, what's it, the thorn is father to the oak. Um, so bramble land and uh, um, hawthorn thickets are very good places for that kind of scrub is very good places for for, for, for for woodland trees to regenerate but it won't work with hedging because the farmers need to control the hedging so we got this rotivated to start with um, and then we planted the hedging and fortunately there is a there is a local thatcher in our village who pro will provide us with bags and bags and bags of surplus thatching straw with which we mulch the, the plants really well. So that was our initial, the top picture was our initial uh, lot of hedging. And then there's another picture down at the bottom, which is some more. And then there's another picture um, down on the right, which is some more again. And the special thanks go to Mariah Ballam who initiated this and she's the one in the green jersey. And I can't remember Daniel, are there any more pictures? Is that the lot? Subsequently to that, oh no, this is we've, um, ah yes, so this is restoring a hedge along a well-used footpath, um, and that's, that was this year, and then subsequently to that, I think that's the end of those pictures, is that right? Subsequently to that, um, there are two areas that have been done by our local tree warden, um, one of which was planted last year, and came to absolutely nothing because the straw provided a really, really super um, hidey hole for voles. And the voles pulled the trees down through the tubes and took about 90% of them. So we've replanted that one this year and actually not, not put the straw mulching on. And then there's an, a bit up by the, up by the, um, by the crossroads that we've also done one one um, one edge of a, of the big field there that just opposite where the AONB starts. Um, in addition to that, our local tree warden has taken up the tree warden network initiative of of seed nurseries, um, disaggregated seed nurseries. So she's enlisted about fifteen people in Waldron Field to to gather and grow. Um, local native seeds and this is a really inspirational project by the by the tree warden network um, because all the all of the, the seeds that that people have gathered will be have been recorded so we know exactly where they've come from so we know exactly what their provenance is um, and as as always um, this is very very erratic my birch trees don't they haven't shown at all yet, um, but somebody else has got probably a forest of Scots, 
spots pines more than you will ever need. Um, but that's, that means that um, we will have our own trees because the ambition to plant trees, to plant, plant woodland over the whole country means that even the Woodland Trust might be running short of trees. And it's not just a matter of supply, it's that the things that do best in your area are likely to be the things that come from your area. I've got a whole lot of questions though about what's going to happen to these hedges because our local farmers um, employ a contractor who flails the existing hedges to within an inch of their lives and they they look absolutely horrible at this time of year because they're they're so destroyed and also they're not given the opportunity to grow both as high as they should and as wide as they should um, and nor to thicken at the base typically they're they're flail straight down or possibly even going in at the base. Um, so I was very interested in, um, in the thought that the AONB might provide some leverage with either farmers or landowners as to how to maintain our hedges, how to keep them in a way that's really useful for wildlife. Thank you very much. Thank you, Betsy, that's, that's great. Well done, all you people in Walden Field. Um, next, we've got Stephen Harvey, who's going to tell us about Kirkland Community Woodland. Yes, good afternoon. The impulse to create a woodland in Curtin came here through a nasty developer who bulldozed a lot of trees in the village to create a convenient flat building site. Well, having lost the battle to save those trees, my wife and I explored how to create a new woodland. On the advice of the Greenlight Trust, which helps people create community wild spaces, we started our group before we had any land. And they encouraged us to do four things, to try to create a community wild space, obviously, to involve young people, particularly school children, to create a local community group to plant, maintain and manage it. And the last one, which we never really managed, if possible to create a link with an overseas wildlife area, because we're all stewards of our local wildlife areas and responsible for them to the rest of the world. Well, we never really managed that link, but the concept is that you and I in Suffolk are responsible to the world for the Suffolk mudflats, just as Brazil is responsible to us for the welfare of the rainforest. And if we all thought that way, we might not be building Sizewell Sea on top of Minsmere, which really does seem to conflict with the nature recovery plan we heard about earlier. We started our group working with our local primary, Trimley St Martin School, and we built a tree nursery there and took the children out looking for acorns and other tree seeds. I had an absolutely wonderful morning the first time I knelt on a plank across the tree nursery helping a six-year-old plant an acorn. I'll never forget that. Meanwhile, we took presentations to the local farmers and asked them to let us beg, borrow, lease, acquire, anyhow, somehow have access to an acre of land. Um, we tried to sell them the idea of bringing up a new generation of young people who would grow up with the trees they planted while we all learnt a lot of woodland skills along the way and we failed. The government was just starting to really push the need for more housing and every landowner was waiting to see if they were going to make a fortune overnight. Meanwhile, our group took on the management of the woodland margins of the churchyard, but because we never got the land we actually wanted, it became quite difficult to sustain the community's interest and the group went into a kind of suspended animation. However, last year, the village charity, which runs the allotments and pastures, decided that they could spare about half an acre for us. This became possible because we have two new housing developments in Curtin on either side of the charity land, connected by a new public footpath, which enabled access to the new wood. So we have already planted the hundred odd uh, hedge plants um, which I thought there was a picture somewhere, but I can't see it. We've already planted over a hundred uh, hedge trees in this area. 
we have a new energetic steering group we, with links to two schools who will soon be running competitions on how to plan the site. All things come to those who wait and how right the Greenlight Trust were to say start your group first. When the land came we already had an organisation, a bank balance, a mailing list of interested supporters and some basic forest skills. While the community woodland is by definition open to all, we hope that the young families on either side of those two housing developments will soon come to see it as their activity area and will take pride and pleasure in becoming its stewards. Too many community ventures are staffed by the over 70s. We have here a golden opportunity to hand over to the 30 year olds and I hope that our little story will encourage other people to create their own wild space. Like so many things, when it is just a hypoth hypothetical idea, it seems daunting and impossible. But once it starts, it just becomes a succession of tasks to complete with a lot of enjoyment thrown in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Um, next, we've got uh, Charlie Zacks, who's going to talk about Transition Woodbridge promoting wildflower villages. Charlie, over to you. Okay, this is where I have to get my computer to work. <laughs> I've got some slides coming. I'm oh yes, they're coming, brilliant. Um, so yeah, Charlie from Transition Woodbridge. And we've been working really hard on some wildflower villages um, in conjunction with James Mallander and his East um, Suffolk, pardon the weeds campaign. So this is a verge we started working on um, last autumn and it's right by the main road um, just down from, um, uh, yeah, the main road in Woodbridge and we've stripped the turf because it's really important to strip the turf to reach the poor soil which is where the wildflowers thrive. So we reached the poor soil, um, we measured how much seed we needed we have broadcast the seed, so we've just, just thrown it really finely into the, the porous soil. And then we just trod it down, and it's really that simple. Um, so at the moment, we are just waiting with our, our fingers crossed um, for the, the flowers to come up soon. Now, the idea of doing this in the autumn was that <laughs> the winter um, and the frost and the rain to really help the seed, um, to condition the seed so that they will germinate really well uh, um, shortly. So we might need to top up the seeds um, in the future, we don't know, but we really plan to just let nature run its course. Um, we're of course going to monitor what seeds come up, what flowers grow well, and which pollinators come and visit us. So this is one we're really excited about. But if anyone is thinking about doing this, um, we've done some other verges and we've learned a few lessons and we thought it was really important to share them with you today. So this, if you look at the pictures, looks like a really successful, fantastic project. Um, unfortunately, it didn't go so well. Can you, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, this was a, um, a verge where we had already planted some of our um, fruit trees and we had uh, large community engagement and everyone loved the, the fruit tree planting project and we thought brilliant we will plant some wildflower seeds here. Well we did and they came up and they looked beautiful but unfortunately we found out um, that people don't always see beautiful flowers as verges. Um, sorry I can hear you've got feedback and I've been distracted People don't always see wildflowers as beautiful flowers, they see them as weeds. So we had a lot of problems um, with neighbours and we had a massive consultation with the neighbours, lots of chats, but unfortunately in the end we had to convert this beautiful verge back to a grass verge. Um, we did however um, dig out all the plug weeds and we planted them in verges um, where residents were um, receptive to the ideas. So really our lesson that we learned is, is 
don't do this sort of a project without complete neighbour buy-in. And it's a really valuable lesson. And um, yeah, um, just thought we should share that with you. Um, not only have we been encouraging wildflowers in um, burges, but we've also been trying to um, encourage them in um, gardens. So completely inspired by Adrian's Felixstowe um, project, um, we, we started our own wildlife corridors project. And one of the things we've been encouraging people to do is to um, convert their lawns to wildflower um, meadows. And this is one such garden, which is absolutely um, stunning. Another project that um, we've been doing, which I don't have the picture of here. Um, I was going to show some different slides, but this is good. This is um, really ties in with, with Betsy's um, hedge planting. And this is a wonderful laid hedge that we have created on Fen Meadow, um, a really, really wonderful community engagement project. We've had um, older people in the community working with younger people in the community. The house that you can see in the background lent us their house so we could do the watering. Um, another local um, centre gave us all the mulch and we've done a, um, with the Woodbridge Town Council, um, we've laid um, a strip of hedging at the front there in front of that laid hedge. So really lovely um, community project. Um, did I have another slide on here, Daniel? Oh, um, just really quickly, because I know we're really, really late on time, but we now have 63 trees in our fruit tree planting um, community orchard. And again, these flowers, they are fantastic for pollinators, but the key here has been the watering. Um, it's really, really important to water your trees if you want them to provide lots of fruit. So we have a massive watering rotor, but I know we're out of time. I know the slides have all gone really wrong, but thank you, Daniel, for rescuing me. Um, and yeah, <laughs> do, do look at our website to find out more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, next, we've got Jill Reese from Halesworth Town Council. <laughs> to tell yep. us about the community garden initiative for her town. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, we've got a four year plan for Halesworth Town. Can you hear me? Yes. And uh, in, that in, in that four year plan, we said we want Halesworth to be known as a green town. So we had to decide what a green town was. And the town council, um, has in spread out all over the residential um, estates on in the town eight green spaces some large some small we don't own we only own one of them so we looked at the one we own first and it was a large piece of land tapering off to a point in the center was some scruffy children's play equipment and it was known as the play area and we thought that's not really good enough. So we got together a group of us from the Environment Committee and we planted uh, nine trees to start with, three rowan, three crabapple and three wild cherry because they'll all blossom and they'll all be attractive to bees and butterflies. And in amongst those, at the top end, we're going to put wildflower seeds and we're going to have a wiggly path coming down through the trees and the flowers, which will be mowed once a fortnight. And that's the only bit of it that will be mowed is a path. And there will be two metal double park seats for people to sit on in amongst the trees and the flowers. And the, that's phase one. Phase two is to update, paint and upgrade the children's play equipment because in the research we did, the residents don't want to lose it, but they would like it updated because it's very scruffy. And stage three uh, is a large flat green space at the bottom. And we thought we would have a community garden. Now we saw a community garden as perhaps plots, raised beds perhaps for people who couldn't bend down, uh, plots for people who haven't got gardens where they could have a garden of their own. Um, but uh, that didn't seem to go down too well with um, 
people they weren't particularly interested so we've now gone for what else can we do and the one thing we've learned is with any of these projects you have to be adaptable you have to be able to change your mind to suit what other people want and it seems that the residents would like outside activities on there perhaps in the summer like um, tai chi outside art classes um, all sorts of exercises. If anything, the um, pandemic has taught us, I think it's that people want to be outside in the air. And so we're looking at that. We're also going to ask local artists if they can design some concrete animals that will turn into seats for children to sit on, highly coloured and put so they can't, nobody can run away with them, they'll be too heavy. Um, we have had some vandalism. We've had one rowan tree pulled out and just left on the ground. We've put it back in and we hope we caught it in time. Um, but, but that's something we may have to look at. Um, in the other spaces, we did a review uh, of the residents who either faced onto, sided onto, backed onto the residential areas, spaces, and asked them what they would like. And without fail, they've all asked for blossoming trees. They don't want just green ones, they want blossoming ones. Wildflower spread or in uh, collections. Uh, somewhere to sit, because all of our um, green spaces are just green bits of grass. They haven't got a seat or anything in them at all. Uh, picnic bench for, fit for family groups. Now we have a men's shed in Halesworth and they will build us the, the um, picnic benches. Um, I'm going to get, I'm going to buy the seats because I think they should be metal. If we have wood, they deteriorate. And I have found a site that will sell us um, double park benches uh, in metal for 75 pounds. I don't think that's bad. One of the problems that all of our residential green spaces are having is dog problems. People are being extremely lazy walking their dogs. They're not picking it up. They're not binning it, even though there are bins there. And so we're going to have a new slogan, which is bag it and bin it. And we're going to make sure that all our green spaces are able to be sat in on the ground by children if necessary. Um, and make sure that uh, they don't have dog, dog mess in them. We have got bins everywhere, but people aren't using them. And we've just found out they're actually using the uh, snow bins for the salt. <laughs> they're full of dog bags. Um, I have found a, um, a, a firm that will supply us with trees on, under a charity. They have been given money by the government to Green Suffolk and they're called SICON, S-I-C-O-N Foundation. And I've managed to grasp up to a thousand pounds worth of trees of our selection. We can choose which trees we want, what size we want, where we want them. And the two provisos they have, which are not nasty, are that their charity or a member of their charity can at any time without appointment come and look. And that if we have to chop one down for any reason, if it got struck by lightning, they need to know. I don't think that that's too awful. Um, so we've asked the residents what they want. They've told us I'm going to meet with the residents on each patch with a small map that I will do first and or the Environment Committee will do first and say this is what this is what we think you might want. Give the map to the people before we meet them and then they can change it and decide what they want. And ultimately, at the end of perhaps an hour's meeting on each site, we will have exactly what the residents want. And unless you do what the residents want, you're wasting your time. OK, thank you. Yeah, lovely, Jill. Thank you. Yes, resident buy in is absolutely, absolutely crucial. Um, thank you for that. Okay. Um, next, we've got Graham Gibbs from Waybread, who's going to tell us what he's done for nature at home by creating a wildlife haven. Graham? 
Thank you, Jane. Yeah. Um, yes, a slight impost, I'm afraid, because Waybread isn't in East Suffolk, it's in Mid Suffolk. <laughs> but I'm on here because I represent um, Emmanuel Church in Bungie, so, which is in the area. So <laughs> forgive me. Um, I'm going to read it because I'll never keep in four minutes. Um, the Paddocks is a large Georgian vicarage sitting on five and a half acres, a green oasis surrounded by agriculture. If you want to look us up on Google Maps afterwards, our postcode is IP215TR, India Papa and Tango Romeo. I first started growing in a small corner of the field way back in 1984, 36 years ago. Otherwise, apart from my parents renting out two sections to neighbours who kept pigs, the field was an overgrown mess of nettles and brambles from at least 1964, because that's when I arrived there. A uh, tender age of six, in case you think I'm too old. Um, from day one, I wanted to work alongside nature. Now jumping forward to the present day, I look after my extended family of adults with learning disabilities, and some of them work on our small holding. We are self-sufficient in fruit and veg, and we have five veg gardens, a large fruit cage, polytunnel, orchard, herb area, and we sell fruit and vegetables at the gate. We also have 55 solar panels and a 15 kilowatt wind turbine, so we grow our own electricity as well. I can't possibly mention everything that we have done to encourage nature in the last 36 years in this, in this four minutes, but I'll do my best. We have planted lots of different trees, especially berry producing varieties, and try to create different habitats to encourage as many bird species as we can. There are homemade bird boxes everywhere and a well-stocked bird feeding station. During this year's Big Garden Bird Watch, we counted over 70 birds, and we knew that we had others that didn't turn up in the specified hour. We regularly see buzzards, kestrels and sparrowhawks, but we obviously have enough cover to keep all our smaller birds safe. Although we have areas all around the small holding where our smaller wildlife can live and thrive, we have created what we call our mini beast area. Our insect house is made from four wooden pallets and filled with a wide selection of materials from bamboo canes to pine cones. It has a dugout basement with broken bricks creating little crevices to give, our, to give our newts a safe haven. We call this construction our mini beast mansion. This sits on the edge of an area filled with tree trunks drilled with a mass of small holes, a curved roofing sheet covered with small branches, two hedgehog houses, recycled compost bins and piles of rock rotting logs and sticks. This is surrounded by a hawthorn hedge on three sides and large mature trees on the other, which helps to keep this area shaded and damp. We have a large pond, which we'd cleaned out after our lovely neighbours filled it with every piece of junk you could think when the field was, wasn't used, including two halves of a van. We kept a small island in the middle as a sanctuary and made sure that there was a gentle slope down to the water's edge on one side of the pond. We have also made a bird hide from recycled car tyres with a corrugated iron roof, which is naturally camouflaged by the trees and the ivy. We purposely didn't introduce fish as they would have competed with the birds for the insect life. We had a pile of old car tyres which we used to use when we grew Christmas trees. So this year we have made a tyre wall along the entire back of our small holding but we've built in seven deer holes along its length. During the period of snow in February, when you could see the footprints, the muntjac and rabbits were already using them. We have a motto at the paddocks. If the grass is cut, we live on it. And if uncut, the wildlife live on it. The only time we enter 
is when we thin or clear an area to revitalize it. If we don't, each area gets too overgrown and even the muntjac can't hide underneath it. We, really, we released two hedgehogs onto our small holding around 10 years ago. And although too early, we have already seen one running around looking for food. And here's a question for you all. This morning, I was very, very disheartened and disappointed because we found our poor little hedgehog lying in the middle of our back lawn. Um, it wasn't curled up, it was dead. It wasn't curled up. It was all sort of, it looked as though it'd been walking along, keeled over sideways and there it sat and there it laid. So if anybody knows that one afterwards, I'd be interested. Um, we hear the hooting of different owls, bats fly around, our pheasant population increases when the local farmers have a shoot. The squirrels pinch our walnuts. We have butterflies, bees, dragonflies, ladybirds, moths, wasps, great crested and common newts. The list is endless. We have to fence off the areas we want to protect, but living with nature, with the wildlife around us, is so special and I will never take it for granted. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Graham. That's very inspiring. Very inspiring. Um, right, next we're going to Alan Collett from uh, Albra Amazing Swifts, who's going to introduce briefly and then treat us to a, a clip. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Um, first of all, thank you for to uh, Green Print Forum for giving us the opportunity to share with you just a little bit about our Swift Conservation Project here in Albra. My wife and I started this project about four years ago uh, with a, the sole aim of getting some Swift nest boxes up in town. Now, little did we know then just how much support we were going to get from residents, businesses and other organisations. But to suffice it to say, the short version of this story is that we now have over 150 nest boxes in Albra and surrounding villages. We've run a series of swift roadshows at local primary schools. Uh, we've distributed over 3,000 copies of our children's storybook Storm uh, and indeed uh, started a swift rescue service. But rather, to, rather than go into the detail, we thought you might like to see just part of the video that Suffolk Wildlife Trust put together for their Nature Summit a couple of years ago, showing some aspects of the work we, and indeed other groups, have done. I hope it inspires you. Thank you. Daniel, over to you. I knew nothing about swifts, and I was one of those people who wouldn't have known a swift from a swallow from a house hunting. I think the most rewarding thing for me has been the Swift Rescue Service that we've started because to, to find vulnerable birds that you know would not survive if you didn't have them um, and to actually feed them, look after them and release them has just been huge. It's been absolutely incredible. We've also produced flags and uh, banners and beer mats and just when the Swifts are returning for the past two years, we've held uh, a welcome back party in the town to highlight uh, the return of the Swifts. Halfway into the party, one Swift arrived overhead and we all erupted with, with joy that the bird had joined us. You know, there are a lot of things that we can't easily do as individuals and small groups, but as far as Swifts are concerned, because they're such an urban bird and they share our communities with us, uh, we really can work for them and really make a difference. Okay, uh, back, back to you then, Alan. Was there anything you'd like to add to that at all? Alan? Sorry, I thought there was um, a little bit more coming there. Um, but certainly, um, the uh, 
whole emphasis that we put on this project is uh, is getting local people involved. And uh, I think today we've already heard a lot of people say, get people involved. And for us, um, certainly the um, local retailers, the pubs, you saw a clip there of us in the library where we've had displays, uh, our local vet has been involved and not least of all our builder Graham who's put up all our nest, not nest boxes for us. Um, we've also had financial support from East Suffolk Council, the AONB, Adnams, Suffolk Secret Holidays, uh, and this is, as, as you saw, enabled us to produce uh, leaflets, beer, max, beer mats and banners, um, and certainly the, uh, uh, the involvement of the local school has been a big way to go through the children and get to their parents. So again, we'd always uh, urge people to get involved with the local school, uh, and we've been hugely inspired at how they've uh, uh, you know, helped us and, and want to learn about wildlife. So really the, the message we had is, is, is very much about getting other people involved. Uh, and even if you just start small by putting up a bird feeder uh, and then, then encouraging other people in your town to do the same, or whether you set your sights higher and look to, to, to work on a specific species, then yes, do get people involved. Um, and yeah, thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Oh, thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. Uh, right, finally, we've got uh, Lynn Alexander from the Lettering Arts Trust, who's going to give us a heads up on an exciting exhibition Trust are putting together for this summer called On a Knife Edge. Lynn, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yes, the Lettering Arts Trust is an advocate for a heritage craft, an endangered craft of lettering on stone and wood. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a lovely exhibition um, about lost words, which was the uh, Jackie Morris and Rob McFarlane um, inspired book, um, Lost Words. It was a great exhibition, but it showed us how much people care about nature. Now, this exhibition that we're having this summer, it starts in July 9th and goes all the way through the summer to November 7th, um, was inspired by the State of Nature report, which was commissioned by 70 um, charitable organisations, um, basically about the state of our nature, and it is absolutely appalling. If you'd like to read an abridged version of that report, it's on the RSB, RSPB website. It really is a shocking read. Um, so we thought, well, why not get our artists to actually f comment on how they feel about this, um, uh, this, the state of nature in this country, because we are only concentrating on the UK um, and actually produce a piece of work. Um, and it will be in stone, it will be in wood, or it will be on paper or even glass, one of them is. So, you know, do come along and see it. It's fantastic. It is really going to be a fantastic exhibition. And after listening to you all this afternoon, I feel as though this could be somewhere that if any of you want to actually send in any of your information, um, it would be a great place to display it. We get visitors from all over the world that come to Snape Morting. So, you know, please do get in contact with me and we can work out a way of actually uh, putting on show what you are actually doing in your neck of the woods. Um, we are actually um, teaming up with Suffolk Wildlife Trust um, for wild little letters nature um, workshops for school children. Um, they will come to the gallery, they will look at the exhibition, um, they will go out on a walk with one of the Suffolk Wildlife Trust people and they will come back and they will produce something with what they have found on their walks, something to do with lettering. So it's going to be a, a fantastic series of workshops throughout the summer. We have also um, collaborating with the Suffolk Poetry Society they ha have asked their members to actually come up with poems about the, the nature, the disappearing nature, and they will be producing a booklet which will be available um, during the exhi exhibition. We will also be producing a catalogue of all the artworks and hopefully essay an essay or two by a few famous um, naturalists. 
Um, it, it is, I know we're running out of time and I know we're really, really late, but there are possible um, collaborations that we could have with you. You could have your own PV if you wanted to at the exhibition. It could be private. You can invite people that you want to interest in your um, specific project. It would be um, great if um, any of you could um, really join with us and actually make this exhibition something really to be talked about and thought about. Um, so if any of you would like to give me your information, it would be fantastic. We're quite happy to, if you want to talk to people, we can arrange a talk, we can invite local people. Um, yeah, it would be great if you could do that. And that exhibition again runs from the 9th of July to the 7th of November. So it would be great. That was very short and sweet, but I'm very, I'm very conscious of the time, how much we've run over. But thank you very yeah. much. Thank you so much, Lynn. And um, um, perhaps we can post where people should contact you or, or contact us. Yes. Yeah, yeah, my email. Yeah, that would yeah. be great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Well. Uh, we've gone way over time, everybody. I'm sorry. Um, haven't done very good timekeeping there, uh, but this is my first virtual event, so I'm feeling quite pleased that we've even got this far. Um, thank you to everybody who has um, contributed, and we've got loads of questions in the chat, but obviously we've overrun hugely, so we're not going to have time to answer them here, but um, we've Daniel's going to be doing a uh, report of the event, which he'll obviously put out to everybody who's on the Green Issues uh, newsletter um, list. And, um, and you should uh, get the answers to your questions uh, through that. Um, I think that's probably the easiest way to do it at this stage as we've overrun so much, but there are such exciting projects from the grassroots and it's so amazing what everybody is doing. That is just really important to hear what people, people's experiences so that we can all pass on, you know, good things and bad things and, um, and such a range of things that we're all doing, which is just brilliant. Um, so um, just to wrap up, I suppose, um, the message I've got today is, is we can all help with um, nature, nature recovery, uh, creating networks, wildlife corridors, green corridors. We need to take time to uh, enjoy visiting nature, at the RSPB, Stuff Wildlife Trust, AONB sites. Um, and we need to develop our understanding and, um, and share what we know with other communities and, and within our own communities and upskill our local communities. Um, obviously, if we do things like the garden watch, uh, bird garden watch, somebody mentioned, and also the big butterfly count, that all helps getting data. And um, Daniel is um, looking for a, a, a details on um, getting an impact on the verge rewilding that James is uh, initiating um, and wants a monitoring system for volunteers. So if anybody's got any ideas about that, please can they feed them into Daniel. Daniel's also uh, going to follow up the meeting with a number of webinars. Uh, we thought this might be another um, thing to do, uh, keep everybody posted. Uh, but we'd like your ideas about what sort of webinars you'd like to see. And um, otherwise, I think I'd just like to thank you all for coming and thank all our speakers uh, hugely. It's just been fantastic. And thank you all so much. And um, any questions, pass them to Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jane. And yeah, just just to reaffirm, um, yeah, I'm sorry we didn't have time to actually address any of the questions and comments made during this session. Um, but um, that was really the reason why we what we record in the chat so that we can capture all that. It's one of the one of the advantages of doing these things online is that um, any questions that, that don't get aired can be captured and dealt with later on. So we'll cover those in the event report. 
that will be coming out over the, the next few weeks. And that'll um, I'll, I'll make sure that everybody on this call, as well as all members of the Green Print Forum, um, receive that. Um, so, um, yeah, so thank you ever so much for, for your input today. Thanks especially to our, our speakers, Michael, Alex, um, <clears throat> um, um, uh, James and, and Adrian, and also to all of the grassroots speakers who've taken the time to tell us about some of their inspiring community level um, projects and initiatives. Uh, I, I really do hope that you found something from amongst the, the wealth of information and um, knowledge that we've shared today that you can take away back to your homes, back to your families, whatever networks you're a part of, and, um, and, and see if there are opportunities for you to, to replicate um, any of these. Because um, yeah, the, the, the more of us who do something, um, the, 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 well, the, the better it will be. Um, yeah, we, 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 um, um, yeah, it's such a big issue uh, and that we mustn't let that daunt us. We just do the, the bits that we can uh, where we as individuals and organizations have control over it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all for coming.